Well, we suppose it did its job. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most hard to watch documentaries. We're guessing since you're here, you must be a pretty avid fan of intense documentaries, and no one has a better catalog than Mr. Theroux. So why not check out WatchMojo UK's list of the top 10 Louis Theroux investigations. For this list, we'll be looking at various documentaries that are extremely painful and difficult to watch, either through their challenging subject matter, horrific visuals, or emotional storytelling. Number 10, 13th. Not only is Netflix putting out some fantastic television, they also released one of the best documentaries in recent years. 13th was directed by Selma director Ava DuVernay, and it tackles similar issues of race and oppression. 13th is ironically named after the 13th Amendment, as the documentary argues that slavery continued after the passing of the amendment, in the form of convict leasing and disenfranchisement. It maintains that it continues to this day, with the war on drugs and mass incarceration targeting people of color. The whole apparatus of the state was set up against me, and they really meant to send me to the death chamber in order to make a point. It's a horrifying look at America's troubles with racism, and offers a compelling argument that we need to do better to ensure future equality. Slavery has already been amended once. Let's not do it again. Number nine, Zoo. If you don't move your bread, <laughs> and I mean bread. With a name like Zoo, you just know it's going to be a difficult watch. And it is, but not in the way you may believe. The title is short for Zoophile, the name for a person who practices bestiality. The film explores the taboo subject and includes the story of Kenneth Pinion, a man who died after receiving anal sex from a horse. It's strange, eerie, and fascinating, and it tries to challenge our views on this type of behavior and the people who partake in it. And while it treats its subjects with respect, the content matter may prove far too difficult for some to stomach. You're connecting with another intelligent being who is very happy to participate, be involved. Number eight, Tarnation. I'm uh, just calling to get the status on my mother, Renee LeBlanc. Tarnation is certainly a unique documentary. It chronicles the lives of Jonathan Coet and his mentally ill mother, and its story is told through 20 years' worth of film footage, answering machine messages, and video diaries, which were filmed and collected throughout his upbringing. What was your first memory of the first mental hospital that you went uh, into? Tell me! No, much. tell me, tell me, because it's not your fault, Renee. It's one of the most original yet heartbreaking documentaries ever made, and its subject matter regarding mental illness and mother-son love is both extremely challenging to watch and deeply touching. It makes for a unique viewing experience, but its disturbing content will leave you breathless and emotional. These little pumpkins are ounced out. Tip me over and pour me out. Number seven, Titicut Follies. <coughs> Hospitals have come a long way since the 1960s. Titicut Follies is a brutally depressing look at the inmates of Massachusetts's Bridgewater State Hospital, a hospital for the criminally insane. The documentary harrowingly depicts the hospital's patients living in squalor and facing harassment by the staff. It was so controversial that it was banned from the public after a Massachusetts Superior Court judge claimed that it violated the patients' privacy rights. However, the filmmaker, Frederick Wiseman, believes that it was banned to protect the reputation of the state. When it was finally made available in the early 90s, an amendment was added, stating that quality of life had improved at the hospital since the documentary was filmed. Just swallow. Number six, Dear Zachary, a letter to a son about his father. My upset. Dad. This documentary began after Kurt Quinn's friend, Andrew Bagby, was murdered by his partner, Shirley Turner. After murdering Bagby, Turner announced that she was pregnant. The documentary centers around interviews with Andrew's friends and family members and was meant to serve as a scrapbook for his son, Zachary. I said to him, Andrew's dead. And he said, no. And I heard him throw the phone. However, the documentary soon veers into true crime territory and becomes a scathing indictment of the Canadian justice system, complete with a harrowing outcome which will leave you emotionally distraught. The film allows us to shake our heads in outrage and blot our eyes in equal measure, and it serves as both a shocking family drama and a beautiful tribute to a great man. I said, find her and I think you'll find who did this. Number five, Blackfish and the whale let go of one foot and grabbed the other. There certainly have been many difficult and challenging documentaries surrounding sea life. 2009's The Cove was a mesmerizing documentary about dolphin hunting, and 2013's Blackfish concerns the practice of keeping killer whales captive as entertainment. It unflinchingly depicts the disgusting treatment of these whales. But the orcas had been caught before, 
and they knew what was going on, and they knew their young ones would be taken from them. To be fair, many people in the industry have denied the film's authenticity, claiming that it was exploitative and sensationalized for drama. Regardless, the film was a success, as it helped raise awareness and resulted in many changes. These include a drop in SeaWorld's revenue and the passing of California's Orca Welfare and Safety Act, which will help to phase out captivity of killer whales. SeaWorld CEO did tell me you're going to start seeing fewer whales in the marketing, fewer orca plushies in the shop. Number four, capturing the Freedmans. Problem list of Jess? Nope. Did you ever do it? Never touched a kid. Andrew Jarecki has made a name for himself in recent years with his stellar HBO documentary, The Jinx. But in 2003, he released another impressive piece of work called Capturing the Freedmans. This documentary details the lives of Arnold and Jesse Friedman, a father and son who allegedly molested children. I had a good family, right? Where did this come from? Jarecki raises some doubts regarding the validity of their guilt and the possibility of police coercion before leaving us without any concrete answers. It's a difficult movie not only due to the disgusting charges, but also because it shows a possibly manipulative law enforcement that may be more concerned with a guilty plea than uncovering the truth. We carefully investigated this case for trial. Really get into the case, examine, investigate, and try to build a defense. Number three, Paradise Lost, the child murders at Robin Hood Hills. Do you feel that the people that did this were worshiping uh... Satan? Yes, I do. Following in a similar vein, Paradise Lost follows the trials of the West Memphis Three, teenagers who were accused of murdering three young boys. These teenagers lived in a fiercely religious community, the residents of which believed that the murders were part of a satanic ritual. The movie then highlights the biases that the community has towards the West Memphis Three. Like capturing the Freedmans, it tells a difficult story about lurid subject matter while raising tantalizing questions regarding the subject's innocence. They were all sentenced to life, although they were released in 2011 under a plea which sees defendants personally adhere to their innocence while acknowledging evidence is against them. Jesse Miskelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, Damian Eccles, I hope your master of the devil does take you soon. I want you to meet him real soon. Number two, the bridge. So I turned the kite back and then I looked over and you know, before they hit, I realized it was a person that had jumped. Suicide always has and always will be a very heavy subject. And the bridge is a fantastic look into the minds of painfully troubled individuals. And it makes for supremely uncomfortable and taxing viewing. Inspired by a New Yorker article, the filmmakers filmed for thousands of hours at San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, capturing 23 suicides on camera. They also filmed over 100 hours of interviews with the deceased's family members to get an idea of the stories behind the suicides. He won't call it that because no. it's a sin to commit suicide in his mind and that's not what she did. Whether you view the movie as well-intentioned or voyeuristic, there's no denying that the footage it captures and the stories it tells are hauntingly tragic and painfully real. And he had found one of the kids sidewalk truck and he was sitting behind Matt's truck and he wrote, end me on the ground. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, to whose savior, to whose kingdom it stands. The thought of what somebody could have done to him, it gives you nightmares. <laughs> Number one, the act of killing. Kalau dulu kita main pukul, pertama itu datang kita main pukul, itu kan darah banyak. The act of killing and its companion piece, the look of silence, are some of the most heartbreaking and morose viewing experiences a person could have. The film recounts, through present-day interviews and artful reenactments with the real perpetrators, the mass killings which plagued Indonesia from 1965 to 1966. Also known as the Indonesian Genocide, this massacre primarily targeted communist sympathizers and left over one million people dead. It makes for horrendous viewing, and it offers us a glimpse into the minds of mass murderers, particularly that of Anwar Congo. And it is not a safe or comforting place to be. Coba buat melalui layar lebar, buat apakah sepertinya uh, layar kecil lah, apa sebagainya lah begitu, tapi kita harus Tunjukkan. Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from WatchMojo and subscribe for new videos every day.